So, um, hopefully you guys can see this pretty well. Um, as I was saying, this is uh, episode four of the Open Ethics series. Um, I know I've seen some of these names before. So, um, today we're going to be going over the robustness and safety in the world in of AI. Um, and I, like I said, I'm really excited to host this conversation. Um, and um, I think the content today is, is fantastic. So, I'm really much looking forward to that. Um, so, uh, the agenda today, um, uh, we have the, uh, someone, background noise, uh, Nikita, can you, uh, mute? You should be able to mute. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, agenda today, uh, we have the opening, which is this, um, we're going to, we have three speakers today, um, Nikita, uh, Ronald, and Raj. So, um, very, very interesting uh, backgrounds for me. So, I'm, I'm super happy to to have everyone here today. Um, and they're gonna uh, all each have their own little presentation. It'll take about 15 minutes. Um, as we're going through the presentation, there is a link in uh, chat, and this is the link here to Slido. Um, if you've never used it before, it's uh, an app in your web browser where you can submit questions. Um, so as there are questions um, during the, the presentations or just, you know, questions that you come up with throughout the entire um, session, feel free to put them in Slido um, and we'll uh, address them after um, the, the, the um, individual presentations. And when we get to the panel, we'll start answering some of them. Um, then we're going to have a closing and then the resources and networking. Um, if you haven't joined Discord already, um, I, I would highly advise you to do so. Um, that's where all of the material for uh, from the talks today will be posted. Um, and then any uh, conversation related to the topics um, that are brought up today will we'll continue there. Um, great community. Um, and the link is in, again, in the, uh, the chat there. Um, so panelists, um, first off, I will introduce myself. I'm Sabir Blackman. Um, my background is kind of all over the place, but currently uh, working in the uh, security space. Um, I've done uh, you know some AI research. I've done AI engineering. Um, today, these days, I'm more in the provable security and privacy space doing researchy stuff. Um, I enjoy Rust and OCaml and Idris and lots of weird programming languages that no one else cares about. Um, but they're all really, really relevant for security and privacy and basically building systems that we can sort of depend on. Um, and I'm a huge open source advocate. So, um, you know, I'm super happy to to be participating in the open ethics series here. Um, so uh, our first speaker is going to be Nikita, who is the founder and of open ethics, um, CTO of Pop, uh, Public Confidant. Um, and has quite a, a, a background in, in some AI fun stuff that blows my mind and I can't even begin to explain. Um, <laughs> and then has quite a, a background in HCI, which is fantastic. I'm, I'm a huge fan um, and a Microsoft alumni. Um, our second speaker is going to be Ronald, um, who works for uh, FAA, Systems Engineering. Uh, ridiculously smart, and I think that one's going to be a lot of fun. Um, to go over as well. He works on safety policy and standards at the FAA. Um, and obviously we all know how important they are, hopefully. Um, and then uh, last speaker will be, be Raj, um, who works in healthcare AI, um, does uh, sort of become a subject matter expert in some of the security and adversarial aspects of, uh, of AI and machine learning, um, which is very near and, and dear to my heart. So um, hope, hopefully we'll have some great questions there as well. Um, and if you're on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, uh, hashtag open ethics series is sort of like the, if you have it, please tweet, um, anything interesting, any thoughts about, uh, about the talk, um, the talks that you hear, any questions that you come up with, um, really trying to engage it beyond sort of, uh, the, the folks that are here, um, on the call today. And I think that's it. So um, again, links for for things. I'll show this again at the end so that we're not um, not missing anything. And um, I will introduce Slido. Um, and so 
Uh, again, this is the the link for everyone who is. Um, this is, will be, you know, how we will uh, poll uh, questions and things like that. So you can uh, submit your questions. People can upvote your questions if they, you know, share the same question. And this will be where we uh, pull questions for the panel discussion. Um, and there's also a poll. Um, and uh, we'll be activating some of these polls throughout the discussion today. Um, the first one is, is where are you currently located? So um, if you join Slido, you can submit your uh, your question, your answer here, and then it'll, you can kind of um, get some of the, those data points there. Dublin, wow. Yeah, I know we're, we're pretty, uh, it's pretty late in the day for, um, for uh, sort of, uh, for Asia and, and um, those parts of the world, but you never know. <laughs> I'm kind of curious where, where folks are. Um, so we have Ann Arbor, Boulder, lots of other, um, I assume there's gonna be a lot of US, but um, cool. So yeah, I'll, I'll uh, sort of track the results here and we'll discuss them um, before the, the panel discussion. So please, Submit your, uh, your your vote, if you will, here. Um, so I think with that, um, we're going to start off with the, the first presentation by Nikita. So I will stop sharing my screen. And um, yeah, you can share yours. Hello, everyone. Let me start sharing the content of the presentation. Yeah. Let me know it's if if that is visible on your screens. Yep, it looks good. Okay, so there is something I need to do first before jumping in the presentation is swapping the the screens this way. Um, so hi again, uh, I'm founder of Open Ethics uh, Initiative. It's a community initiative. And today I would like to talk about Open Ethics Transparency Protocol to build trust with users of autonomous systems or users of any decision-making system. And what I want to talk about today is, uh, first of all, to, to, to bring this into a discussion space. Uh, not to a solution space, but just to make sure we we very very much understand what what problems are in front of us. And second is to bring some uh, bring some ideas that can address part of this problem, not not the whole problem, because whole problem is not yet uh, is not yet addressed and it's not going to to, to be addressed in the, in the very near future. So uh, let me start with this. This is a regular narrative uh, narrative that is available to all of us today and we see it frequently in the news ai beats humans human lawyer human doctors in a specific narrow domain uh, and what i want to be clear with with all of you but some of you are coming from from the ai space uh, and some are not but some are working on uh, in the different domains of either software engineering or uh, human rights. Uh, what we need to understand is that AI ethics is not about this. It's not about Terminator style scenarios. Uh, it is very much about what actually we can control and what we give machine control of. And uh, if we look at uh, machine decision making, if we break it down into uh, several stages, uh, we can look at perception, decision action, and then evaluation of decision. And obviously we want to do better at every of those stages and what is happening today the landscape the landscape of the of the regulation is pretty complex and and i would say that what we what we start observing is the competition between uh between different standards of regulation or what should be achieved and there are countries who have several uh, several groups working at the same time uh, of course european union is working on their set of regulation. Even in the European Union, in the European Commission, there are two groups. The one is a per, per parliamentary group, and another one is, is a set of committees that are working on uh, establishing uh, establishing the guidelines and may, and transforming these guidelines further on into standards. 
what this uh, what this leads to is that we start getting many and many of those regulations and where, where every uh, where every regulatory initiative or AI ethics guideline initiative uh, is defined based on a set of uh, requirements. And one of the requirements uh, is security and safety. And this is pr a particular reason why we are all here today to, to discuss uh, this requirement, to understand where it fits and what can we do about this requirement. Uh, what happens if we do not fit uh, those requirements or if we don't think about how we train um, train our system and how we use them later on. Uh, I, I recently spotted up this picture and, and for me it's, it's a fun way to talk about the environment for learning and, and how can we how can we change completely the way our system acts if we put if we put uh, our system with the wrong parents or in the wrong and uh, in the wrong learning environment so what do we want to do we want to improve on each of those so what what should we do what can we do uh, the situation today is that roughly 70 or even 80 percent of devices and services and applications that we are in front of us today are using one or another form of AI. We typically don't call it AI. We, we call it spam filter, or we call it a recommendation system, or we call it OCR. Uh, the reality is that majority of users, or not the majority of users, a big portion of users are not trusting, or there is no way for us to, to build trust. So how can, how can we establish this trust? And what uh, one of the ways to to establish trust uh, that we're aware of is bringing a top-down regulation. So what top-down uh, regulator would would do? The regulator will uh, allow a certain set of technology or a technology that that satisfies uh, with uh, with their feature to be present on the market. Uh, there is going to be a certification body uh, that will that will say whether this technology is allowed to be there or not. There will be an issuance of the stamp, but this is one way of regulating uh, of of regulating what's available. And another way of regulating what's available is a bottom up approach, where market where market regulates what's present. And this is what I want to talk with you about by a very simple analogy and this is this analogy is coming from the food industry so what uh, what we know is that there are different kinds of food and some of them we want on the market and some of them we don't want to be present but the interesting story about the food regulation is that we see today when we go to a supermarket to purchase a or b we're able to observe the nutrition for the food and existence of this uh, a, a governed language to sp to speak about the food or to disclose the food is very much the source of the regulation apart from having the top-down um, uh, regulatory procedures safety procedures certification procedures so we get to this we, we can have a choice in, in in selecting different kinds of products so, and and this is thankful for uh, a complex uh, reasonably com complex system that has its own way of working such as expiry expiry dates the way to trace the nutrition uh, the energetic value of food carbs proteins fats uh, and obviously the ingredients and the source of the ingredients. What is weird is that uh, through the last 30 years where personal computers have become a part of our life, personal smartphones, personal apps, and personal algor algorithms, we still have absolutely no idea of what's inside uh, our product or our, our digital products. And, and strangely, the only tool we have up to date is privacy policy or terms and and terms and conditions. And uh, this is a huge barrier and the source of asymmetry in the market because on one side, 
producers know knows everything about the, about the product, and on another side, consumer doesn't knows nothing. And uh, where it leads is that we tend to click "I agree," "I read," "I accept" without actually knowing uh, what do we agree on. And that's fine, uh, or relatively fine, when the issues that we're facing are only related to privacy. Well, maybe we can lose a part of our identity due to the security leak, or maybe we will be exposed to uh, a very strange uh, use of our data. But what is happening today is that we're starting to see in front of us uh, tools that make decisions on our behalf or make decisions for us. And this is where uh, this is where we are more exposed than we were than we were before um, since since we have the operationalization and and wide use of machine learning products that are trained based on our data so what can we do about that well maybe we can follow uh, the idea and start uh, start start disclosing and of course disclosure could be of a different types we can disclose forcefully or voluntary and open ethics is actually about this about, about how can we transform the disclosure into something very simple human readable and to do to do this kind of disclosure we don't only need to standardize the the language of disclosure uh, but we also need to transform it into humanly consumable viewable understandable and very simple disc, uh, descriptions of the product such as uh, this product is selling your data, or this product is uh, using your data for decision making with legal consequence, or financial consequence, or any other, or any other uh, type of consequence, uh, or this product is using your personal information for research purpose. Why not? It could be as simple as that, and it shouldn't be more complex than that because we don't need to have uh, a legal background to be able to understand. Uh, understand what happens to us and what kind of risk we're facing. But before coming to or, or arriving to this uh, situation, to this state, we have to be uh, we we have to be able to speak on the same language. And this is what we're building in in Open Ethics Initiative. Everyone is of course uh, invited to join. But what 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 I want to talk to today about is about the background work that we called an Open Ethics Transparency Protocol. So what is Open Ethics Transparency Protocol? Um, it's a way of sharing the information about the uh, about everyone who takes part in uh, algorithmic decision making. Uh, why this is important is because more we move into a microservices uh, architectures where we employ multiple different uh, vendors in our decision making or in our data processing, we need to also understand what kind of risk this bring to to our overall and complex solutions. How do we do that? And the and to to do that, what we propose we propose a mechanism of backward chaining mechanism where every uh, every vendor uh, comes up with the uh, with the file that describes uh, their measures that are securing privacy, their measures that are securing uh, that are brought uh, and uh, are making the product safe. There are measures that uh, that counter bias, discrimination, improve value sharing, and this file we w the information in this file we call an open ethics vector. By the analogy or or by the by by the principle that every decision is made in in its own uh, in its own ethical framework, and what we 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 can decide which decision is decisions right or wrong but what we can specify is we can specify whether decision this decision is a part of one frame of thinking and whether it has uh, it has certain uh, criteria implemented and what we do then is uh, we're able to give provide this information assign this information by voluntary disclosure to every vendor what that means is that vendor uh, 
uh, goes through a specific uh, specific survey plus plugs in a script that does a technical audit into their uh, into their uh, product and comes up with the voluntary uh, with voluntary disclosure. And what this disclosure does basically it plugs in into a uh, into the processor downstream and into a data processor downstream again and again and again. So we get the overall picture of uh, of the thread, and we're able to then uh, do the do the validation or transform this picture into uh, this set of visual labels. So what is the, the process is very simple. The the very top uh, vendor or data controller or product that is uh, interfacing uh, that is interfacing the end user does the request once he signs up for a vendor. What then this request does, the request validates uh, the open ethics transparency protocol file or um, the ethics vector. Uh, what it means about validation is we check if the disclosure uh, corresponds to the signature that was issued during the disclosure, so it's valid. We don't verify whether the, where, whether the disclosure is true or not because we don't have a means for that. It's the technical audit should be done for that. But we're talking about the validate only. Then what it, what we do? We do the request for chaining, and what we we chain this information and we look down and we look at all downstream vendors who supply their files. And once we collect all this data, we do the disclosure. So this is the final disclosure. Basically, every vendor upstream is providing their disclosure. Uh, downstream, and we collect all this tree, uh, all this tree of disclosures. How does it look like for the end user, or where the where is the use case? The product owner, or the owner of uh, of the user facing product, what he is doing, he has the complete version of of this file. He's responsible for his own product. He's responsible for for his own disclosure. Then. If he works with the developer, if he's the if he's a systemic integrator, he looks for all the transparency protocol files, standard files, uh, from the vendors, and what then this file, uh, yeah, what then we do with this file, we transform it into something human readable, like those set of icons you have you have seen to the end user, so that the end user can demand and can filter by those criteria that he wants, and the protocol file it's a standard json file which you, some of you may have been working with operated with that has a certain uh, certain set or list of uh, list of elements so for example here uh, we're talking about the aspect that concerns the validation of the data, whether the data is critical, and where and what kind of validation we use. So one of the methods that is presented here, presented here in this file, is human in the loop validation uh, for for the healthcare for the healthcare product. And this kind of disclosure could be presented and then checked upon if we if we do have this standard way of talking, but not the not the legal jargon that has no way. For industrial, um, for industrial law enforcement or for industrial standard enforcement. So, this is very much where where we are today. We have launched the very first version of the label, and I want to uh, to invite everyone to go in and test it and understand how it works. So later, I can provide the link in in Discord. Uh, share it and 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 answer questions also during this discussion. So what we're working on right now is the definition of the complete transparency protocol to move it then to an open standard for such a for such a disclosure, and then so that either open ethics or other uh, players will build an open platform that can use this uh, this files of disclosure to make users more comfortable more. Um, so that they can trust the products and and everything. So this is the uh, this is the roadmap that I have, and I want to finish it with three uh, three aspects that that we really advocate for is the accountability, augmentation, and appreciation by design. 
respecting values uh, and goals of every human, uh, augmenting human capacities, but not replacing it and treating humans over tool, almost like an agile manifesto, but um, uh, that's uh, uh, that's it. And I'm uh, open for, for questions and open for any context that you want to establish later on. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, very, very cool. So yeah, if you have any questions about um, uh, about any of the material, um, any of the topics you want to follow up on, um, there is a link uh, for Slido in the chat. Um, and uh, actually, Nikita, if you can post that again uh, so that doesn't get lost, that'd be cool. Yeah, sure. Let again. me let me repost it. Yep. Um, and so, any questions uh, follow up there will be um, will be great. We're going to be covering uh, any questions there at the uh, at the end of the panel discussion or at the beginning of the panel discussion. Um, I did have one question for you. Um, and so, like, I, I I think what you've described, Nikita, is like it's multidisciplinary. You know, by intent, like you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, product owners in different disciplines and different communities who um, are, you know, who have a stake in this conversation. Um, like how for, for folks who come from different backgrounds and, you know, different domains, like how is that, uh, process of collaboration working now? And like, you know, if they wanted to join, like what would that look like? Yeah. So, yeah, maybe it's worth sharing the, the screen on my side, uh, just a second. Let me do this. So um, there are several ways contributors can contribute to to the to the project. Uh, so one way is, of course, to join the initiative. But what happens next is is very much up to you. You can promote and be an active ambassador of the of the initiative share the manifesto first read and understand if this actually resonates with what you think and how things should be uh, how things should be what our beliefs are is that top-down regulation is good it should be present but that it's not sufficient uh, because if we if we actually want to do not only uh, check boxing uh, and making sure that all the rules are uh, all the rules are satisfied on paper we need to include a consumer, a user, an end user to the process of uh, choice and informed choice that is not happening. Uh, that is not happening for digital products. What what is happening for digital product? You can't you can't choose before you use. So you have to use the product first, and then you choose whether you like it, whether you understand, and whether you treat the risks right. But what we want to push it. To, we want to push it that you choose first and then you use. And you choose based on uh, the risks uh, that you're aware of, uh, based on the disclosure. Because if, we, if, we, if it comes to a food products, the story is very much the same. We, what we see in the supermarket is not validated by anyone, right? But at least we have this information, we can take this information and if it's not true, or if we were if we're not satisfied, we can we can go and object. We can go and um, and create uh, create a request to the to the producer or to the, or to the vendor uh, to reconsider the presence of the product on the market. And uh, I think this is what worth worth uh, worth to be built for uh, for the technology space, uh, especially for consumer consumer type of applications uh, this is promotion part uh, development uh, part uh, be part of the open ethics transparency protocol review help us to build this standard language help us to write code help help us to build a platform educate this is what we're doing today with sabri ronald raj we are uh, bringing information about how to uh, how to talk about ethics in a very concrete way and uh, of course, uh, 
people or companies who want to who want to engage in it, they can also donate. But it it gives no obligation. We don't do any preferences for those people who donate. We really value uh, donations, but we uh, we do not do preferences for companies with donations. Uh, that's uh, that's it. And thank you, thank you for questions. So I was able to cover it. I hope to uh, I hope to see people uh, joining uh, the initiative and and pushing it forward. Absolutely. Thank you for that overview. Um... Yeah, I think um, that is a good segue into the next talk. Um, and so I am going to activate the next poll. Um, and if you haven't, um, Teams, there we go. Very good. Um, so um, we have quite a few results. Uh, we do have some folks in, in Asia. We have some from Korea. Um, it's great. I'm looking. I'm glad everyone has managed to to show up, and I'm um, looking forward to the questions afterwards. Um, and so, th the next poll: What are your key safety and robustness expectation from AI systems? Like, um, I'm sure there there's quite a few, uh, uh, a lot of opinion, and sort of a lot of um, you know expertise in, in the audience. And so, how does that sort of translate into uh, you know, what are your expectations? What are your requirements? And like, you know, what do you need for this to work in your industry and in in your domain? Um, and I think that uh, hopefully we'll have some some interesting uh, answers here. Um, which is also a great segue into the next speaker. Uh, Ronald at the FAA um, is going to be presenting next. So let me um, stop sharing. And there we go. Um. OK. Got everybody there. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to walk down through uh, another type of example. And this one is from uh, the critical infrastructure side of the house. I uh, want to thank the um, uh, Open Ethics Group for the opportunity to speak today, but I also want to um, identify that the concepts that I'll be talking here today are those of mine and not necessarily the official position of the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. So a uh, quick bio, this is in the thing, I'm not going to go over it in any detail, just provide some high level background, I didn't know how we were going to do this today, but so. Um, the first slide is really robust uh, and safe AI and setting the stage. Um, I come from a world that uh, work in the critical infrastructure sector, specifically transportation. There's about uh, 16 or so of these um, uh, uh, that, uh, that various countries deal with. And specifically in the national airspace, which is part of transportation, is um, the area that, that uh, I work within. And um, this uh, sort of um, graphic over here is one that we use. One of the one of the things I do from a system engineering standpoint is try and connect the dots and, and let everybody understand all the interconnectivity um, and complexity that goes on in this. And AI uh, is part of that. And so there's there's two areas that we look at AI. There's AI for analytics doing a lot of post analysis kind of, of work and looking for different classifications and trends and relationships that we didn't see. But there's also this AI for control and oh, what's the role of the human in that? Um, and that's where we get into our safety critical and efficiency critical kinds of functionality in the, in the national airspace system. And right now that's an area where there's not a whole lot um, uh, out there um, but that's where some of the big, big issues fall. Uh, uh, before you continue, can you switch into slide mode? There's some requests. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Does that work? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, before we go, there's a lot of talk, uh, talk today about ethics. And a lot of that kind of discussion around ethics drives very quickly into trust. And what's the acceptance of trust and how do we provide uh, evidence of, of trust? And so that's where I'm going to focus some of my time today. Um, one of the things I wanted to do before I go too far is understand the, that this is not um, 
and and as Nikita talked about, this is an international kind of thing, right? So just between the European Commission and the executive order in the United States, you start to see there's a lot of consistency going on here about AI and uh, being robust, um, trust, uh, uh, ethical, uh, down in the, uh, in the safety principles kinds of things. So there's a lot of um, international... Um, I don't want to say harmonization right now, but collaboration that's that's going on, and everybody sort of agrees that this is an area that uh, needs to be um, needs to be addressed. And I have links to to these uh, items um, a little later on. So the the big thing that we see with um, with uh, robust and safe AI are some of the challenges, and one of those we have is. You have good development, but you have uh, the bad use of that, right? So it's designed in a way to be used, but but how it's actually utilized out in the real world uh, ends up being uh, bad, whether uh, intentionally or not. And so that's an area we've got to we've got to deal with with um, with um, AI and ensuring the ethics. The other one is this human AI collaboration. Um, Nikita talked a lot about this. It's not about AI taking over the role of the human. It's about augmenting um, and assisting um, and those areas where AI is best suited um, that 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 um, that AI can be applied. And one of the things he brought up was that decision model. We have a, a similar kind of thing that that we work in aviation which is the OODA loop the the uh, you know obtain orient decide and act kind of thing and so where is ai and in, in the ability to help the human uh, obtain an orient um, so that the do that quicker so that the human can still make the decision and act um, but you're you're speeding up sort of that overall um, decision making process and the third is is a lack of common values so we talked a little bit about there's a lot of things going on and not just in europe and the united states but all over the world but what is that common set of values in terms of ai ethics and trust and things along that, that lines which gets us to standard so what are some of the mitigations around that well good ai development and good use and how do you how how make you do that well you can uh, develop these ai ethical principles and you can apply those and you can um as nikita was talking about be able to validate and the, the human is in that loop to make a determination that's that it's being done right um another big area that that um i talk about in a lot of different um uh, forms is uh, not a lot of people are talking about the underlying organizational transformation that has to occur um, for uh, AI to, to get into the operational sort of realm. The, um, the, the things that we do today in terms of policy, in terms of uh, data, in terms of development, um, those are all uh, based off of um, uh, systems that are driven by a set of requirements and a lot of these systems are now going to be driven by data um, and so what does that mean and then and then a lot of these models and algorithms are sitting in software items and hardware items to support an overall system so how does that all work to together you also have um, the skill sets in the workforce the behind behind all of that that has to be worked you've now got um, data scientists that are now in the game um, versus operational and uh, software um, software specialists and hardware specialists. So this underlying organization has to also begin to um, to move and move maybe from a also from a development process of waterfall to agile or hybrids of, of such of that. Um, another component uh, that folks are talking about are um, you know codifying, this right into the algorithms that that limit what the algorithms and models can do. So even if they're given um, uh, maybe suspect data, that it it recognizes sort of that, and so you codify that. Uh, next is the human AI co collaboration I talk about. Um, 
current policy right now, at least in the United States, is keep the human in the loop. Um, but what does that mean, right? You have um, human in the loop, human on the loop, human monitoring the loop, human governing the loop. Uh, how does that play against the various tasking types that may occur in this? So a lot of that kind of work um, uh, needs to, to be done. But there's also been um, stories out there, and I've I've seen this on some of uh, on some of the things. You say, you know, how do you stop some of this bad stuff happening? And and you'll get someone say, well, sir, we need to develop AI algorithms and models to monitor. You know, so now you're getting down to the the, the end of this AI, AI human collaboration, which is machine to machine. And now, do I have AI machines monitoring AI machines? Um, and, and what does that mean? And so, uh, is, is that, is that the right kind of thing? So those are some of the things. And, uh, and then last is the standards to promote ethics and trust. And there's a couple of different things going on. There's joint international committee, SAE G34, Euro K1 working group 114. that I'm going to talk about, about AI and aviation. Uh, you got IEEE standards, ISO standards. There's a lot of standards out there on, AI and 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 some stuff going on, and some of them are are uh, general based, and some of them are sector based. Um, like I said, the SAE Eurocake stuff is very aviation based. <clears throat> um, so one of the areas I want to talk about is trust. Uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States which under the uh, executive order was is responsible for defining how the federal government um, engages in the development of, of standards. And so they've begun to, to put together um, some things. And so they've come out with these uh, AI trust properties, and it's very high level right now. They, uh, there's research going on about what each of these mean, and then how does that feed into these uh, standard development organizations to turn these into technical uh, requirements uh, in which a vendor or an applicant can show compliance and a cert authority can make a finding of compliance. And so that's explainability or interpretability, resiliency, fairness, uh, reliability and accountability um, are are four of at least what the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology is is talked about. Right, explainability, understanding what's going on in that model and algorithm, and 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 what is its scope, and how far, and how much can it learn and change over time. Um, resiliency in terms of, I, I see resiliency, wrote a paper on this um, a couple years ago about of resiliency. There's the protective phase, which is all your safety and security and sort of your known hazards and vulnerabilities, and you do what you can to mitigate those. The second phase is then this detect and respond. Um, because you have a series of unknown failure modes that you may not have thought about or beyond the, the ability to, um, to actually uh, mitigate them because of uh, uh, extraordinary costs, but you still understand the end consequence. And so you've got to be able to monitor and then respond to that. And then, of course, the final is to, the, is to recover. Um, so how can we do that um, from an AI ethics, uh, AI trust uh, world. Um, fairness, um, in our world, that fairness is, a, is about our uh, diverse users, um, not, not really uh, talking about uh, age bias or gender bias or race bias, um, but in, in our world of uh, the National Airspace System in aviation, it's about the diverse users getting equitable access to the airspace to operate like they want. Reliability, as we all know, um, meeting its intended function and doing it in a consistent way and accountability is uh, being able to trace the actions and changes. Um, and so there's a, a link there to, to find out more. And they have um, their own sort of webinars that, that go into this and build on that. Uh, SAE G34, you're okay, we're in group 114. This is a group uh, that I'm involved in. There's about 500 uh, plus members. 
We're focused on the implementation and certification related to AI technologies for safer operations of aerospace systems. That's airborne and ground and aerospace vehicles, manned and unmanned. Um, later this month, early in November, a, our uh, statement of concerns document will be out, which was basically looking at um, all of the issues that need to be addressed in the actual standard. We're also putting out a taxonomy um, and all of that information will be out and then we'll be begin to work um, the uh, AS 6983, which is the process standards for the development for certification and approval of aeronautical systems in which uh, AI is um, is being used in that systems. And that's that standard there is being targeted for the 2022 timeframe. Um, to support certification into safety critical efficiency critical type systems. Um, so I just want to close here with, uh, as Nikita said, it's more of a discussion than a solution. Um, get out there, support the R&D in critical areas of, of uh, ethical AI, um, sharing that information. Uh, the sharing that information allows us to then move into and develop standards with that. Uh, proactively engage in the development of standards. Um, they're all consensus based, so um, you can either stand back and wait for their published and, and have to do what they say, or you can be part of that and influence that with um, the work you're doing. Uh, third is transform your current organizational business. Begin to think about now how your organization underlying that that's, that may uh, develop these AI products has to change in order to support that um, in terms of workforce and culture and skill and data management quality, um, hybrid development process. And then lastly is the diversity of teams. Um, uh, I was involved in a, in a particular uh, uh, thing where our, our one group of our operational SMEs threw the data over to the data scientists at a contractor. They did all their 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 great stuff and made it look good. Brought it back and brought the output back. And um, and I had just sort of asked a simple question because they talked about how they cleansed and normalized the data on the front end to optimize their model and algorithm and then they cleaned up the output and the output happened to be uh, uh, particularly look at like an altitude profile of an aircraft right and I simply said to him I says well what if the data that was you were given was reflective of an engine control system that was failing and not providing the right amount of fuel to the aircraft thus causing the nose of the aircraft to porpoise uh, so that the altitude profile looked kind of strange rather than nice and smooth and um, you know immediately everybody got quiet and I said you're right you, you without these teams all together you may have masked through your cleansing and normalizing of your data to make your op optimize your model and algorithm. You may be masking the very thing that we're trying to look for in a safety critical system, the, the failure modes or, or things. So, you know, uh, have your operational SMEs, have your domain experts and your data scientists all have to work together um, as, a, as a single entity, not uh, not as throwing data over and waiting for the output. Um, and then lastly are some links. Uh, the European Commission link, uh, the United States Executive Order to the link, various policy that's out there through uh, uh, OECD, Office of Economical, uh, I'd have to look that up, NIST, uh, other standards that are out there that you can look at for AI and, and, and uh, ethics. And um, that's basically all I had. Awesome, fantastic. Thank you for that. That was a lot of information. Um, yeah. And I kind of wanted to uh, address uh, two things that I think sort of piqued my interest, um, especially because I work in cloud systems and I work in kind of compute. Um, and we have a lot of sort of like machine AI sort of observing other AI, observing other machines, and mm -hmm. that's sort of normal in our, our industry. Um, but for other industries, like I'm assuming I know what the answer is here, but like I, I don't know 
are we are we at a, a point where we can begin to safely implement system like that? And if not, like, what do you think is necessary? So uh, a lot of this talk was was about what needs to be done. There's a lot of stuff going on out there, and this is really what what started me in in this um, as the uh, uh, looking at enterprise analysis and taking on this whole application of AI into the national airspace system was uh, as as I went to various forums like this, they were talking about how they were using AI, but a lot of it was this IT business process side of the world, not really this mission critical, mission, uh, mission uh, efficiency critical kinds of, of things. So there was this area there that you knew over time, AI, machine learning, and, and the, the trust was going to move into those more critical areas. So what do we need to be doing today to begin to build that trust and that ethics in so that we can hopefully accelerate the, the use of that onto onto the uh, onto the platform and so like the example i just i just gave you you know is the kinds of things that we need to understand the skill sets and, and what that mean to work together and the underlying organizational transformation uh, understanding what those trust properties are and the standards so that um, uh, an applicant or a vendor can show evidence that they're doing that, and the cert certification authorities can actually make the finding of compliance based off of that evidence. And that's what we don't have today. So the, there's a lack of this, what I call path to operations. There's lots of stuff being done behind the scenes. And you, and you can do all of this right now today with all this post-performance analysis around the national airspace system. You know, see what happened over the past month worth of data. And see. But to, to, to take like that example that I told you um, for this aircraft porpoising, which um, if you were to move that algorithm to a controller's spot or into a cockpit of an aircraft to give you real-time alerting of that situation. Um, we're not there yet. All of this stuff that I talked about has to get in place so that we have that trust and assurance and, and the ethical principles and can make finding a compliance to ensure that that system is going to operate safely and within its intended function and that data will not drive it into a, a, a down a path that we don't know how it would react good question awesome man like i think you also sort of highlight the importance the continual importance of experts right yes. and you know we started with expert systems and you know experts are they're expensive but they're still necessary Right, that's part of this process, and they will be necessary. Well, and that's a lot of thing in the national airspace system with the aircraft and with air traffic, right? There's this whole continued airworthiness. So after this is installed on an aircraft and the aircraft or the, the air traffic system goes into operations, we are doing continued operational uh, airworthiness of that system and making sure it's, it's doing what it says all the time. Um, and so that's where the monitor, then the monitoring component comes into and, and, uh, you know, what's, so what's that architectural, uh, what's that architecture configuration of, uh, um, to, and, and what do you know, is, is the monitor safety critical and you allow the function not to, because you know that the monitor is, or do you have the function and the monitor at at same which be, can become expensive so there's the safety analysis and security analysis and all of that stuff would have to be done to drive those requirements excellent awesome that's a lot of very useful information um like I'm, I'm thinking through a lot of these problems right now in the compute space and we haven't even begun to talk about standards or <laughs> or any of these sorts of things really in a, in a meaningful way so um, you know, I, I think that that's extremely cool. Awesome. I will, um, like you're raising your hand. Yeah. What do you have to say? Yeah. Yeah. I have just a, one little question to, to, to Ronald, uh, given, given the presentation. So Ronald, you mentioned at least two times failure modes for, uh, and defining failure modes and, and for, for the system engineering. And I think it's one of the 
one of the most critical areas to make sure that our systems fail in the, in the way we want them to fail or in the expected way. And I wanted to 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 stop here for a minute or two to talk about design and disclosure of failure modes for AI systems. So w what is your take on it? How do you view it and see it happening in uh, aviation industry? And how would you extrapolate this to, to a broader set of applications? So uh, we sort of have it today through our safety management system and our, our cybersecurity um, certifications. You know, all of that has to, to, to be assessed and, and all of those. Um, and, and it comes back to those known failure modes and what's an acceptable level of risk, which comes back to the standard, which is going to define that that everybody has agreed to. Um, but there, and this is why I wrote the, the resiliency paper a couple of years ago, was because sometimes we'll get into a situation where we say, well, you know, that's, that's, that's 10 to the minus 9th, or that's 10 to the minus 10th or 11th. So the chances of that happening are, are very slim. Well, something comes along, and of course you can look at an accident and you go, that was never supposed to happen, Right. The, the consequence is the same, right? I mean, whether whether somebody fat fingered something into uh, a flight management system on a cockpit or somebody intentionally drove something into the flight management system or the air traffic automation system, um, the consequence is the same. I lost service. Um, so the the second part of that resiliency is the monitoring and detect. And then what do I do when I lose the service? I, I'm not worried about, okay, I thought maybe somebody would fat finger the wrong thing in and, and shut it down. And here were the, here were the, the uh, steps to, to fix that. But I've lost my service, and, and here's what I have to do to recover. So um, getting back to your thing, I think that's already in there. The question becomes now, or we need through all this research and 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 through this kind of stuff understand what are the failure modes of of ai machine learning and any of this emerging technology that's what we don't know we've we've got a history of hardware and software now but this whole ai machine learning i, I you know i was i've been taking some some courses and they walk through all of this in detail and stuff, but, but then the instructor says, but don't worry about it. At the end, there's always, there's already these pre-trained algorithms that you just run your stuff through and it'll be fine. And I'm thinking to myself, no, I can't do that. I need, I need to understand because I don't know where that pre-trained came from and, and whether it accounted for uh, my sector of the critical infrastructure. So, um, so that's where a lot of the, the research, and I think, you know, once you, I'm always, um, I always come from a, a top down and then move back to bottom up, but a lot of people like to drive the low hanging fruit. And I think we've talked about this, Nikita, in some of our, our very early, you know, they grab that low hanging fruit, they get that simple algorithm and, and model, and then somebody comes on and say, hey, can I use that for, and they go, oh yeah, well, let's try, you know, whereas if you think about like I said, if you wanted to use that algorithm I was talking about earlier and put it into the cockpit, there may be certain things that I need in terms of ethic principles and explain the level of explainability. Just think about that of a system that I'm working with post analysis versus a system that's alerting on the cockpit. The the explain you know so. I may want to try at that low hanging fruit what that means so that when I get up here, it's that same algorithm that I was using for post analysis can be used on real time alerting um, on things. So uh, and then from there, you know, I break I break down. I, I, one of the things I do right now real quick is um, which started me on this. I started going to some of these symposiums and they talk about fraud detection algorithms and models right which is what are they looking for right they've got a history on you and they're looking for something that doesn't seem right something that that was outside of this connecting the dots in this this little tube or or they see two purchases at two different 
parts of the world at the same time or very close and know that there's no way you could be in these two locations. Well, I can do the same thing with, with uh, flight trajectories, right, and say uh, flight trajectory compliance. So I've got, I've got the plan that the airline put in. I've got the plan that I approved, and I've got the, what they're actually flying today. So couldn't I use that same fraud detection uh, framework of an algorithm and model and apply it to trajectory compliance? And when I see a deviation, I I alert. So I think that, Nikita, then is, you know, how you can then take these and understand that. And then you could apply it to different things in other sectors, um, without just saying, oh, well, that's fraud detection, so that's finance, and that has nothing to do with me. Well, nah, I'm trying to say, well, how could I use, take the lessons they've learned and maybe apply it in aviation? Just one example. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious about, like, you mentioned failure modes, um, and I think there is definitely still like everything, every system will fail eventually. Um, but failure by AI seems to be a lot scarier than failure by humans, even if the AI is actually better, right? Um, and I'm kind of curious how we, we end up, uh, how we kind of get past some of those. Uh, yeah, you may not emotions. realize the AI is slowly being moved, right? Until it, it gets to the breaking point and um, based on your sector, and and then it's too late. So how do yep. we how do we can have awareness of that? Yeah, very cool. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I will um, quickly share my screen before the next uh, presenter um, and go over some of the results of the poll. Um, so we asked uh, what are your key safety and robustness expectations from AI. And failure modes is the first one. Um, unbiased and trustworthy, resistant to ad adversarial attacks, bias detection, free from backdoors. So there's lots of security um, concerns here, privacy and accuracy. Um, and replace some of the heavy lifting uh, of human operators and do it with the same sensitivities that they bring to the table. And so I think, um, again, like, you know, not only how do we reflect current expertise, um, but uh, sensitivities, I like that word, um, because that sort of expands beyond expertise into to more emotive things, which I think is, is really important too. So um, let's start uh, the next poll. Um, on a scale from one, distrust, to 10, uh, how much do you trust machines in life critical decisions? And so bank loans, medical support, school admissions, uh, uh, education and grades, we've had school admission uh, sort of scandals for recently. Um, you know, I think we are, we are sort of um, familiar with some of the um, uh, banking discrimination and things like that in the past. So kind of curious, like in, in 2020, right now, uh, where would you sort of scale um, your trust here? Oh boy, <laughs> that doesn't look very good. All right, um, so yeah, let's um, let this go. Um, we're going to, uh, move on to the next panelist and revisit this before uh, sort of the panel discussion. Uh, I'm definitely kind of curious where this is, ends up. Um, all right, so stop presenting there. All right, and so next up we have Raj, um, who is, um, are you there? You're there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. very good, <laughs> awesome. Um, I couldn't see you. Your camera is on. So, um, and he's going to be going over um, some uh, addressing some of those adversarial things and security things. So, I'm very excited to um, to hand it over to him. Yeah, thank you, Sabri. So, I would like to share my screen. Uh, please let me know once you share. Uh, I think we may have lost him.
Yeah, it could be just a second out being garage. Okay. Yeah, I think you, the internet connection may not have been the best. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry, I don't know what happened. Just uh, disconnected. So when, okay, can you see now, please? Yep, we can see it. You put it in a uh, present mode and I think we're good to go. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, sorry for that technical glitch. It's, it's always happened with me when you want to, the demo 90% go wrong all the time. So <laughs> it's a tech. So I think uh, already Nikita and uh, uh, already explained about ethics and, and AI and how you're going to include the explainability in uh, in the AI and data science world and uh, it's a kind of challenge. So my experience is all about operational AI, building the algorithms and deploying them so that we can use them on the production. And uh, believe me, it's not an easy task to do that because most of the project uh, uh, are struggling to scale. And, and there are the few things, if you talk about security and data science together, that makes it more complex. So I'm going to talk about few engineering. So previously, so right now, uh, data science and engineering are coming together. And we are, we are applying all the engineering tools in the data science to make it scalable and to deploy on the production environment. And to do that, we have some something which has to be got right and we need to make sure from the beginning uh, those things should be uh, like secure and scalable so this is kind of my background so i just put past uh, so what are we going to talk about we're talking about the model continuous analysis what sort of a decision has to be made best practices practices and uh, how to do it in an organization to make it a scale so it's all about so I did the projects where we are using Agile and data science. I mean, initially, if you think about two years before, Agile and data science was like not happening very well. But right now, the, the what tool set we have in terms of building and deploying it is kind of easy. We can build uh, uh, build model within a couple, uh, two week sprint, four week sprint, and we can deploy it, and then we can continuous monitor it. So. So when I think about the data scientist, so what, what the job at the moment, I'll see that can be one, that is one of the failure of the project where most of the time the data scientist talks about fitting the models, data wrangling. Uh, the less time they spend on getting the requirement and what is the use case for uh, and, uh, and sharing the result with the community uh, within the organization, whether it makes sense. And uh, sharing the result, for example, if you're working as a team, we got a data science team, we got a DevOps team, we got a security team, we got a uh, the product owner. So, so it has to be shared across before actually deploying it, and it has to be go to the different environment from uh, sharing from uh, testing to experimental to the production environment. So that's how it should be. Uh, we should be spending more time talking to the people. We should be more talk. Uh, time talking to the security professionals within the within the organization to make it secure to make it scalable uh, to integrate with our devops tool um, so this is this is something which is need to be done more um, so communication and collaboration they are the two tools i think i think it has been alluded to in the previous talk as well we need to we need to communicate better within the uh, within the team we need to collaborate uh, with, with a different part of the project uh, to make it a success, and uh, this is how roughly it looks like when we build uh, build models. And so we uh, data is the key, and uh, uh, there's so, and so many ways we can do it. Whether uh, we label the data in the supervised manner or unsupervised way, uh, we leave it to to the model and to the to the uh, to the AI to learn the structure and the data itself and train it accordingly. Um, 
so the the very first question what will the model be uh, the analysis will be used again this again the same thing uh, what we are trying to do here what the objective is what the ai watching ai and how we are doing it what the purpose for it uh, most of the uh, the data science projects start from the exploratory kind of analysis and uh, but there there has to be certain objective and uh, whether the objective is Uh, embedded with the uh, explainability and ethics and these are the different different part of it so these are uh, different questions when we when we talk about when when we are training the model what are the features we are going to do for what level of accuracy we are looking for what sort of metrics we are looking for and the data so for example in in cyber security and healthcare which i uh, done most of the project on i, I give this example on the cyber security so so we have uh, uh, we have to make it secure the training process we have to we have to uh, uh, make sure, make sure like the the classification labels so for example there is there is one scenario where uh, we have we have the different uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, for example malicious and benign so we need to make sure the labels not change in the process from test environment to the uh, training environment to the production environment so that's the way uh, there is a risk uh, there is a vulnerability where somebody can change those labels change the malicious to the benign benign to malicious then the, the whole result of the the model is going to be different so these are the few uh, ideas for the good product uh, uh, good project so we need to have a good data we need to clean it uh, curate and protect it so data is the key there are a lot of tools where so there the two things say one is the raw data one is the processed data when the data is processed we just it just like a gold mine for us we need to protect it and we need to back it up properly and we need to have certain tests to make sure uh, the data is not changed and uh, is change according to the the huge case and i mean for example like if you if you torture the data long enough this is kind of tech humor it will confess so in the sense because uh, you, feature engineering it is directly related to so you, you uh, the more you process it the better features you can get from the data and then you can uh, kind of uh, um, construct the model accordingly um yeah knowing the data is the key whether it's a, it's a service security or the previous example for 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 the airline industry and knowing that because the data is the key for the algorithm so we need to make sure the data is not biased when i heard in the news where they're saying the algorithm is biased it's not about algorithm being biased it's about the data is being biased because that's what the algorithm being trained for and um, so we need to make sure this is this is not happening uh of course the the distribution changes over time and that's what makes makes a difference because in engineering projects we know it's very deterministic we know like uh, the changes are predictable in the sense but in the ai world uh, the data distribution changes the model changes the behavior changes the result changes and uh, we need to make sure we are labeling them accordingly and uh, uh, in the distrib uh, uh, and uh, we are keeping track on the distribution as well um, so of course we need to look for the data sources we need to look for the labels as i said before uh, train test splits so we need to make sure we are we are we are splitting into the i mean depends upon the scenario whether you have 80 20 split or 70 30 split Uh, you're training the data. You train more, and then you validate, and then you deploy on the production. So there, there, there's so many uh, ways we can do it. And uh, of course, uh, I mean, I'm, I agree with that. Security data is not a oil; it's a plutonium. So you want the highest quality in the data, and that's why uh, most of the data science project, uh, 70% of the time, they they work on getting the data right for the algorithm, and 20% time is applying the algorithm make sure it works and the rest of the time it operationalizing it making sure it's being monitored properly making sure it's being deployed properly and uh, all these things and uh, yeah i mean there is no uh, single tool or framework in my experience which can do the jobs so you have to stitch different tools together and uh, 
write the test cases as much as possible, validate on each and every environment to test, experiment, and production environment, and to make sure write test for every every phase, and uh, for the for the data write the test for that. For algorithm also you write the unit test for those whatever library you're using, whether it's a TensorFlow, PyTorch, or Cafe. Uh, make sure they're in version. They're in version. Uh, they're put in the GitHub. They're in the continuous integration CI/CD pipeline. So these are the kind of things which is which is we make sure we have a kind of uh, engineering view, the engineering process being integrated with the data science project. Um, of course, we'll say uh, I mean documentation is fairly uh, trivial thing, uh, but. Uh, and documentation is the only way to collaborate, so it's a continuous process. As much model, as much uh, uh, the kind of detail out about the model, what it does, and what are the different distributions uh, will be shared. That's the only way to share across across the team and make sure we have uh, we are implementing it successfully. Uh, there's so many so many ways. The other thing which is coming right now is uh, how uh, because of GDPR and the rules of the data. So it's it's very it's not easy to get the data for the for the data science team to work on, and uh, so there are so many ways. Uh, obfuscation technique is one of those where we scramble the data, and we have the key which is being uh, decrypted. Encryption key is uh, kind of putting an HSM or some uh, secure device, and uh, do the analysis on the data and then share the result. It's kind of segregation of duties as well, so that because the team who is doing the data science and system analyst. And uh, those who are the data engineers, so they don't, they don't collude. So it's a lot of uh, uh, the fraud and those, those security cases. We need to make sure these things happens in that world. Um, yeah, uh, don't read. I mean, when we when you start with, a, with any data science project or anything, uh, as I think as some uh, even mentioned the the, uh, the pre-trained model. Not a big fan of those uh, from the from the beginning because. Uh, we don't know what's the sources they are from, how they're being trained. Somebody put a backdoor in the model. And if you use that, then it in our system and that can be exploited. So of course, but when we are building the model, don't jump on the, the cool tech straight away or the complicated model start slow. Start with the random forest or isolation forest, then go for the autoencoder CNN. So that's kind of logical progression. And uh, of course, the security models keep on changing, and there is a drift. Data distribution changes over time, and uh, so we need to make sure we are using, we are changing the model accordingly, and uh, all the ground truth changes over time as well. So yeah, um, uh, it's basically it's not an individual artifact. It's, it's it's kind of giving the idea for the whole project. And uh, so, um, so we need to make sure the the model what we are building is for the for the for the greater good is not for uh, kind of yeah one can explore in the exploratory environment but then it has to make sense in the uh, in the kind of strategic view of the organization so when we are building it so everything has to be thought of. Um, so the model changes. Uh, uh, there is a. A different uh, kind of uh, it happens when uh, you have to cross check the model. So a lot of attacks can happen, new threats against the models. So that's what is happening because uh, the lot of uh, uh, AI uh, people are using AI to attack AI. So this is happening because uh, uh, because the the, um, the the AI system, which is being the written exploit, which is kind of intelligent enough to go to the system and then understand it. So this is kind of one thing. One is AI watching AI. One is AI exploiting AI. That is the next thing which is happening. So, uh, so we need to make sure we are checking the model, checking the result, checking the performance, and all the campaigns what we are working on. Um, yeah. So. Delivering a data science project is a challenge, and because there's a lot of moving parts in there, there's a lot of uh, things which has to be mature. And in terms of uh, um, uh, data, uh, the processing the data to the delivery to the production for the model, uh, but uh, uh, there are the ways we can do it, and uh, uh, that's me actually. So yeah, thank you. Awesome, very 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 cool. Um, and I think I, uh, you know, this talk 
is probably um, the most relevant to a lot of uh, what I'm currently working on in the security space. Um, and so I have a lot of sort of like applicability immediately um, to specifically like the the AI who's like trying to defeat other AI um, because we're actually in that space right now in cybersecurity where, you know, uh, adversarial AI attacks are actually becoming a thing, right? Now we have to start to develop AI that can detect adversarial AI um, and to various degrees of success. I'm not entirely sure um, how far some of those things are. But I think one of the things that I, you know, is really, really valuable that you've kind of went over is the fact that you've sort of like taken um a software engineering approach which is like you know the ci cd process you know uh integration test framework acceptance tests throughout that entire sort of process and you've applied them to data science projects which is i think which makes sense right um i'm kind of curious like you know it, having you know working at a company where you may see success in that what is your take on the industry as a whole like are they as sophisticated where they have like you know tests and if there is drift like they can detect that sort of stuff or or you know are are they even asking some of those questions or is this sort of like the ideal and you know uh the rest of the industry isn't there yet um i think uh, it's a good question i think it start happening now because uh, some projects they are taking care of the unit testing from the beginning, for example, putting the pipeline, making sure we have the test for each and every phase, but some products are not. But I think uh, if I compare two years before, it was completely most of the projects which I've been seeing, there was an exploratory project, but now the projects are, there is, so all the products, they have the intelligence, they have all the data science models uh, integrated into the products. And uh, once and all the engineering and data science teams are coming together very collaboratively and working in a CI/CD uh, way, uh, it yeah. is happening. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of projects are thinking about it and moving in that direction. And uh, there, are, there are a lot of tool set as well because before that, two years before, if I if I think about, I have to stitch like five six tools together to build it. So like you have used Jenkins, you go you use some of the tools, but right now if I'm using Microsoft Azure DevOps, so I, I have everything in there. And one thing which just start happening is uh, the containerization where we can um, package the model into a container and share it. So as, as I mentioned, sharing was collaboration was the major, major challenge, but now it's happening. We have like, uh, we can put in the container, put in the DevOps pipeline and put all those tests uh, for that to make sure uh, make sure it's not compromised, make sure all the security tests in there. So yeah, it's happening slowly, but it's getting there. Very cool. Yeah, I was sort of like, I worked at Docker actually on supply chain security. So I have a lot of interest in, in some of those things. The containerization angle I think is extremely interesting um, from machine learning and sort of like data science perspective. Um, and you, you, I think you, you've sort of addressed a lot of like concerns around how do you like productionalize a lot of these things. And I think you, you've described a really mature process. Um, and, you know, we sort of went over yesterday, like, uh, you know, when we're talking about this, like I've been, you know, doing a lot of research into sort of like traditional statistical methods to come up with algorithms to figure out stuff about our data. Um, but what is interesting to me is that like, you know, traditional statistics, like, you know, I've been studying stochastic calculus for time series. Like there's a, you have the paper of the work that you've done to get to that point, right? To that output, this algorithm, here it is, you can show it to people. Um, so the explainability is kind of baked in. Um, but if you're transitioning the system where that isn't as clear, even if it's maybe clear to you as someone who's implementing the algorithm, um, how do you, how do you sort of deal with the varying levels of explainability across an organization, especially if you have to explain things to stakeholders? I think the explainability is a very key aspect and that's what when we build algorithm, we think about, about it and we choose the algorithm accordingly as well because 
so we don't uh, jump straight away onto the neural network or CNNs on those 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 things. So we'll see whether uh, what's the explainable explainability labels are because what has to be defined. So for example, there is a I give you one huge case where in the home office, right? So if uh, if the home office is saying that you can't really come inside the UK, then if you're using AI in there, we need to explain to the person like what what are the criteria why the person cannot enter into the UK, and what are the reasons for that. So that's why for that particular use case, we have to apply the algorithm, which is where we can we can explain and exactly what are the labels are and what is this. So we have to go for like. The traditional algorithm like isolation forest or decision tree or those kind of algorithm but if they're the huge case where in the health industry also because when we are uh, working on for example a biomarker which is converting from ads uh, mci uh, mild cognitive impairment to adst dementia then if you're going for fda then you need to make sure that uh, we can explain to the fda what are the features we choose in while we deploy that model so so that is explainability is kind of a very big aspect and that's why we choose our algorithm and the tech behind the algorithm very very carefully when we build those and operationalize those yeah inter interesting points there um yeah i think you know having working in sort of the security research field right now um you know one of my pet peeves i guess is that a lot of the security tooling is moving towards quote unquote AI solutions, whatever that means to to some of these vendors, right? Um, but explainability hasn't been hasn't been prioritized because security tools are sort of inherently black boxes. And so they don't feel like they have to have a need to explain, you know, their proprietary solution. And so, you know, when it comes to proprietary AI, do you think like, you know, how do you see um, companies handling cases where their AI is sort of like their competitive advantage or their machine learning is the, is the product um, and how do you how do you sort of deal with explainability there? Yeah, I have been in that situation before in one of the projects I was working on. I won't name that uh, product, but I was struggling hard to understand whether they're actually using AI within there or not because I found out in one of the one of the feature where it was, just using snort and bro and getting the result from the network traffic from the pcap and when i try to reverse engineer it i didn't i don't have those tools and permission to do it so it's it's a kind of uh, i don't know the trend has to change because most of the cyber security companies they they use ai but but uh, if there is no explainability and there is no traceability and showcase whether they're using ai or not it's very hard for others to believe i mean i was it's like one of the one of the uh, accelerator where uh, most of cyber security companies are pitching. So there was somebody was saying funny, like, and 80% of the cyber security company, they, they say they use AI, but actually they don't. So I don't know. So this is a kind of, and because how, how the people are going to trust them? I mean, if there is no explainability and there is no, and uh, so, yeah, I think this is, this is a really good question. And I think I don't quite know how to answer it properly, but. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know how to answer it either, um, except to say that, like, you know, they're building tools that use AI is inherently requires rigor. Um, and that's one of those industries where because it's unregulated um, and it'll probably remain unregulated. Um, you know, I don't know if there's a good answer, except, you know, give money to vendors who can explain, <laughs> who have that sort of transparency baked in. Um, Awesome. Well, thank you for, for all that insight. Um, uh, Nikita, did you, uh, I see you have the Slido questions up. So um, let's uh, sort of recap together um, and as a group and, and kind of go into some of these questions. I have some questions of my own. Um, I know we're over time already, but um, first question. Let's go. Uh, let's get with it. Do you think certain industries are particularly moving towards or away um, from the AI trust principles from NIST? Um, this is a very interesting question, but um, I'm kind of curious. Uh, I think this is sort of uh, um, aimed at, uh, um, at Ronald, but discussion. Uh, let's discuss. So. Um... 
I I haven't seen any any evidence necessarily of industries, but I, I would surmise that um, those that uh, require some level of uh, regulatory authority, they're going to have to uh, continue to participate and be aware of where NIST is going because through the executive order, NIST has been identified as the um, as the uh, lead um, to uh, to uh, to um, keep the United States um, and our allies uh, uh, leaders in AI, in research, in academics, um, in skill sets. Um, and so, uh, like I said, I, I think a lot of what's coming out of NIST is going to have to be put into standards, which is going to allow certification. The Like the discussion you were just talking about, areas where there's no regulatory, they may move away, but, um, you know, if you want to build that trust into the overall community, uh, I think at some point you've got to come back to something and say, uh, here's the standards by which we're following. And if you can say a lot of other folks are following it, then I think that that uh, that helps you. So um, that would be my answer for that one. Yeah, I think the the obvious parallel to me, right, is cryptography, right? And so like NIST has, and you know, there, there's a lot of crypto standards, but like if you advertise your your product that uses crypto as being like FIPS, whatever, whatever, whatever compliant, right. like people believe that and they understand it and they understand that there's rigor there. And so I would be very curious to see like if companies start to adopt um, some of these standards as a competitive advantage, <clears throat> Um, number one, and then, you know, just it's going to become a requirement in order to even like enter certain industries. Well, and then you move into the whole liability world, right? Because mm -hmm. if, if you don't have anything that you can fall back on and then show that you did your due diligence with respect to that standard, um, because then it comes back to the standard needs to be updated uh, versus you're out there by yourself. So uh, that you know that's a whole nother um, uh, it's a whole nother uh, market force that can force that too. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Like I think if you're and there have been instances where there's been failure of like a crypto algorithm, right? And like that doesn't you're not as a company liable <clears throat> for the failure of some crypto algorithm because it's been acceptable, it's accepted. So you have to update sort of the crypto standard, right? And so right. I kind of see there being a parallel there, which is a great point. Um, that would be a good sort of like forcing function to adopt some of these things, even if there's some expense. All right. There is, there is potentially another parallel that we may observe in cybersecurity space that was happening on the personal level where people were or are put in the dichotomy privacy versus society security security so we may potentially see the same or or a similar question arising uh, in between transparency on the application side and societal security so, or security of the uh, of the application of the producer so how far should we should we go on disclosure and sharing it this, the information about the application or product or the or, or the algorithmic processes, even with the certification body, <clears throat> to how far we should go there to maintain the safe boundary on the intellectual property side, on the side of security of the application and not giving the ability to reverse engineer application by giving the access by giving the access to how things work and how things are explained. Well, and, you know, so uh, coming from the aircraft certification world that I, I served in for about 10 years uh, on, on the federal aviation I, side, you know, we've seen a lot, we see a lot of uh, innovation over there and they have to because of one, the, the initial uh, design approval the continued airworthiness, but part of that continued airworthiness is accident investigation. 
So we have to have insight into that, at least from the government side, right? So uh, I know that's been a, uh, I've seen that on the security side, you know, even I've been a big proponent about uh, just like resiliency, this whole safety and security, right? Again, it's, it's what is the failure mode in terms of I accidentally fat finger something and cause cause the the system to go down or some or I do something intentionally to bring the system down at the end of the day the 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 controls and the mitigations on the safety and security side um you know may complement each other or they may conflict with each other or they may compete with each other um but I ran into this a long time ago when I was trying to bring safety and security standards together in the software world, you would get that. I'm sorry, this is a security issue. We can't, we can't let you see what our controls are. And, you know, it, it wasn't about publishing those controls. It was about making sure that the systems and, and in, in reality, we had a situation at one point where, because safety was being designed in from the front end and then you know back then you had security came in and did their vulnerability assessment at the end and would add requirements right well all of a sudden one of our systems wasn't meeting its performance and we couldn't put it out into the field and at the end of the day what we found out was you know where we may had a, a cyclic redel uh, a, a cyclic uh redundancy check in our software, they came around and put in um, encryption. Um, and when they did that, it slowed down the processing and therefore the system didn't meet its overall performance requirements for moving information uh, like it had to. And it took quite a while to, to sit down. At the end of the day, uh, I, was, I was running safety back then. I said, fine, we'll remove the, the CRC thing and we'll identify your encryption requirement not and we didn't give what the details of that encryption requirement were we just said that encryption requirement is now also a safety requirement and they about flipped out because what, what does that mean well it means if you're going to change the encryption algorithm you have to notify safety because we have to make sure that the safety aspects are still you know because when we broke down uh, when you looked at integrity and privacy well, encryption gave you both integrity and privacy. The cyclic redundancy check gave us integrity. Um, and so we said, hey, we'll, we'll remove our safety requirement and we'll, we'll label your uh, encryption. So, um, you know, there, there has to be some at the regulatory side of the house, some insight into that for design, continued airworthiness and accident investigation insight. So I don't think we can get away from saying this is proprietary you can't see it if, if you want to get into operations you have to trust somebody and, and and we're not out to throw on websites oh guess what so and so company is doing you know that's not it they just get their approval yep yeah i think there's definitely some parallels there with the security and privacy question because a lot of organizational security requirements are like personal privacy has to be broken, right? right? Um, and there's a lot of that in the corporate IT side where they're implementing like packet sniffing and, you know, we're going to break encryption so we can spy on what you're doing, which may make sense from an organizational perspective, but, you know, from a privacy perspective, now that breaks things. So, like, I, I think that that sort of uh, antagonistic sometimes uh, thing will, will very much exist in, in the machine learning and AI space as soon as we... <laughs> start coming up with like you know uh, some of these controls and things well and as you put all these pr properties in it's going to become a game of how do you balance it right not necessarily antagonistic but how do you balance what you, in what situations and safety you know the the balance of those pr of which of those properties are more important in a safety critical system than in a routine yeah. uh, doing a routine function um you know, will differ. And so just like you said, you know, at what point does your your protection, do you give up your personal sure. rights to be protected, um, you know, by law enforcement or whatever, you know, versus uh, no. So, yeah, which brings up another, you know, interesting question of like, you know, if that 
if those things are being decided by AI, right, you know, um, then, you know, and there's no transparency, then we have to inherently trust the entire thing. Um, which kind of brings up to the next question, <laughs> uh, which was, uh, yeah, the Air Force pilot in a simulated uh, dogfight lost to AI. Um, is it not Terminator-like situation when ter technologies like this exist? Um, I, I will sort of inject my, my own personal opinion, which is, um, it will own personal sort of understanding of, you know, the Air Force, which is like, eventually they don't want pilots, right? So like AI fighting AI is hopefully kind of the point. Um, but with that said, there is going to be side effects there, right? Like what happens if that technology is lost or stolen, right? Um, you can't steal a pilot, I guess, right? But you can steal code. Right. Um, and so open up the discussion here, um, like worst case scenario uh, seems to be marching a lot closer. Um, and, you know, it's 2020. So Terminator, who knows <laughs> with the way this year has been going. So kind of interested in, in thoughts and sort of perspective on this one. So uh, I'll jump in uh, first. So I, I recall reading that uh, that article, and there was, um, um, you know, what that really is around going back to sort of what I talked about about the OODA loop, you know, uh, uh, um, obtain, orient, decide, and act. And really what they're talking about trying to get out of that is how to speed up aspects of that decision for the pilot to be able to decide and act much quicker because, you know, seeing a target out there and wondering whether that is a friend or a foe and then getting itself into a position so it can make the decision to, if it has to, if it's in a dog fight, has to, has to fire a missile off to him. So that whole, uh, 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 obtain an orient is is I think what they're looking for in the in the AI kind of world to allow like I said the current policy is the, the human remains in the loop so you could it, it, so you know how do you speed up the uh, the obtain an orient you could get to where you use and this is where I was talking about this whole AI collaboration what do you do in that decide phase right do you just give the information to the pilot and he has to decide and act? Do you give them recommend, does the system give the pilot recommendations so that he doesn't have to have this wide, uh, uh, wide uh, set of options, but he's got a limited set of options? Or does the, does you get to the system gives you and says, yes or no, this is a friend or foe? And you say, I agree with that and act, right? So there's there's how far into this can we go? Or does it get to where the system says, uh, this is this is a bad person uh, and uh, we recommend that you fire and it's the pilot who just has to de decide to push the button, you know? So that's where that whole uh, human AI collaboration I was going to is to what are those various levels of abstraction without giving it all, as you said, machine to machine. Um, and so that that's what's going on in there, I think. Yeah, um, I think like we will often read headlines of experiments like this and take away like, oh, they're they're trying to build super AI that will kill everything, right? But there there's an actual purpose of those experiments. Um, and a lot of that is it's a feedback mechanism into how do we train our pilots better, right? Like there's a benign sort of answer <laughs> there, which um, I think is important to sort of like to, to identify as well. Um, but there are other instances where there may not be a benign explanation, right? Um, you know, especially when we're talking about warfare, it's it's warfare, right? Um, so I'm kind of curious about this, like examples where, you know, the answer may be obviously like this is designed uh, to be weaponized or it's designed to be a weapon and, and where AI and machine learning is in that space. Um, awesome. Any other comments on this one or takes uh, fear mongering? Welcome. 
I mean, I mean, I think what you said about super intelligence. I think we are too far away from the super intelligence. And I think this article there was an. I don't think every time the AI was able to beat the USA of course pilot in just one situation, and we have there are some assumptions being made, and uh, that's what happened under the control situations. If I read the article, remember it. And when actually there is actual warfare, I don't I don't think anybody knows what the situation is going to be like. And if the situation we don't know, we can't control. I don't know how the AI is going to behave as well. So, I mean. This is the different aspect, but I agree with what uh, what being said. I think it's augmented intelligence. It's not about AI making decisions. It's about giving the good choices for the human to make the decision, and that's what AI is good for. So yeah, isn't isn't there like just like a fundamental principle here that you know even if you were trying to develop a weapon or develop something that is inherently adversarial, like you're you don't want to try to build something that's going to be less efficient than a person who's trying to do the same thing. And if the state of the AI isn't where we can replace a person trying to do that thing, then, you know, then where's, where's the incentive to, to use the AI to do that except for automation. And I think there are uh, spaces like in cybersecurity, for instance, where, yeah, that might, very well be the reason because it's easy to automate attacks across the you know the internet and so even if the ai is less good um that might still be okay uh but there may be other examples where you know if the ai is less good then that's why would we use the ai just have a person do it right uh, yeah I, I think there there is very much about the design and as ronald said the configuration of a human in the loop so what role do we give to a human in the in this process? And overall, yeah, we, we we can categorize our solutions into into two groups uh, by design, uh, doing things differently or doing things with more performance. When it comes to when it comes to uh, training pilots, I would assume it's about doing things with better performance of the human or of the aircraft plus human versus uh, another uh, another scenario where we are designing completely new type of warfare by the use of different different processes of the warfare. So as soon as we will bring applications, doesn't matter which kind of applications, that will change radically the processes that we're used to, we will see this disruption. So it's not about doing things a little bit faster, or but, but about doing things completely different in a different way, because we're able to do it now. Yeah, I think the the novelty is sort of like where I see um, the most interesting, yet scary sort of things. Like I think the the adversarial AI is a great sort of um, example of like you know yeah human isn't necessarily going to be able to perform you know, the analysis required to break a firewall, right? But AI can, right, over some sort of time, and that creates a new class of attack that may be highly effective, right? Um, and then now we have to figure out a way to respond to that. Um, I think, like, there are examples where that's exactly right, like there's novelty being created, um, but there are other examples where it, it is really sort of to improve existing processes. Um, yeah, I think um, that's a good place to stop unless there's some other other comments. Cool. Great. Um, there is a um, link for Discord. I will repost that uh, for people to follow up and join the discussion. All of the resources, slides, things that you've seen today will be posted on Discord, um, so be sure to join that. Um, and um, let me check, is, the chat is muted, so no one's been posting on here. Very good, I don't see anything else in surveys. Um, looks like there was a, uh, cool, yeah, I think we're, I think we're good covered all the things. So
any closing remarks? Um, it's been it's been great having this discussion. Um, very diverse sets of backgrounds and and sort of insight. Um, so yeah, any other any closing remarks from anyone? Yeah, we have one uncovered yet uh, yet question, uh, and um, on my from from my side, I want to thank everyone and all the speakers that. Uh, that agreed to join and to share their knowledge and experience with all with, with every one of us. It for for me specific for me personally, it's a learning event where where I augment my my knowledge and understanding of what is out there. Uh, I want to invite you, of course, for the next learning uh, event that we're going to have in a, in several weeks. We're going to talk about traceability. Uh, and the setup is going to be the same. We're going to have several speakers uh, that are interested in the subject and have some results in the subject that will share their understanding. And uh, I will share the reflection of all this in the transparency protocol and how we want to put this in place uh, in in this open uh, open standard that everyone can use. Um, so that's my that's my closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald and Sabri, for amazing moderation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Raj. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nikit. Yep. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. This has been great. Um, and this was, this was recorded, right? So um, where can they find the recording if they want uh, to rewatch it? So recording is going to be present in the YouTube of op YouTube channel of Open Ethics. Uh, we have several recordings out there already, and uh, what what I can do, I can post it as well in the Discord chat. So I'm going to post the the channel URL, and there you can track the appearance of the video that we will mount and put out in a couple of days. Awesome.